those remarks that the president seemed to make in defense of Vladimir Putin and uh, the resulting moral equivalency that seemed to be drawn between the United States and, and Russia. As you saw, uh, Mitch McConnell there, just one of several Republican lawmakers who have since denounced those comments. Um, this seems to be a, another fight that the president is picking here. Uh, what's, the, what's the political fallout, if nothing else, if, for a rift between him and GOP leadership? What well, just deepens the unease that Republicans have about what this president thinks and what he might do in terms of Russia policy. Now, last week there were some encouraging signs for those Republicans still uncertain where this White House would land in its relationship with Russia when the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Nikki Haley, challenged the Russians, condemned what she said was their intentional increase on the fighting in Ukraine and said you've got to get out of there and stop your meddling in Ukrainian affairs. Republicans said, hey, OK, maybe this administration's taking the Russian threat in Ukraine seriously. But when the president of the United States not only draws this odd and historically warped moral equivalency between the United States and Russia under Vladimir Putin, but in the same breath almost is dismissive about the underlying accusations of murder, jailings and deeply troubling mistreatment of human rights activists, dissidents, journalists in Russia, that also creates concerns among Republicans. And when you see someone like the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell, who has consistently, Josh, tried to stay away from any direct clashes with President Trump, particularly about his occasionally outrageous statements, Mitch McConnell will almost always say, well, that's something he said. I'm not going to really get involved in that. I'm not going to take this on. I'm going to focus on my business. When he begins to say, this is something I'm going to draw a line about, I'm going to confront the president about, he's indicating, number one, to other rank and file Senate Republicans, go ahead, say whatever you need to say, say whatever is on your mind, giving them license to clash with the White House. And he's also sending a signal. I'm your legislative leader in the Senate. This is making my life more difficult. It's going to make your life more difficult. And that's one of the things that Mitch McConnell does when it comes to this Trump White House. He tried to stay away and was very successful at staying away from direct confrontations because he didn't think there was much percentage in it for him. But when he confronts the White House, what he's signaling is, you're making my life difficult. And when my life's difficult, your life is difficult. And we're seeing these uh, rather reductive uh, instances uh, of, of uh, well, it seems agendas, if nothing else, running headlong into one another between not just the executive and legislative branches, but now the executive and judiciary branches, as the president did again refer to this federal judge as a so-called judge. Obviously, the chaos uh, regarding the executive order and uh, the resulting travel ban has continued here. We also are learning, Major, uh, from the New York Times reporting today that the president will now be read in on executive orders earlier than before. What to make of nothing else of the change in protocol here? Well, we noticed that last week here at the White House, the promised flurry of executive orders slowed to a crawl, and you felt that there was a new procedure vetting executive orders much more closely, making sure that they were distributed and those whose relevant agencies were going to be affected by those executive orders, had a chance to review, weigh in, and go over the final language. And therefore, we only saw a couple of executive orders late on Friday, nothing else for the remainder of that week. So you could see and feel the process beginning to shift here. This is all a tacit admission, Josh, that the immigration executive order was badly, badly mishandled. And the difficulty the White House finds itself in now is they can point to clarifications made by the Department of Homeland Security, revisions to the executive order announced and enforced by the State Department. Legally speaking, that doesn't matter. The case before the courts is the executive order as drafted. Mm -hmm. And the way it was drafted, as Ricky Clayman indicated, creates some constitutional questions that many courts have said need to be resolved. Not only that, in the case of immigration law, precedent in our country is it's not just what an executive order says, but it's what the actors around it say about it. And when the president says, as he did, Christians are going to be given preferential treatment under this order, that becomes a constitutional issue as well. So it's not just the drafting of the order, it's what was said around and about it by the president. All of those things are coming to the 
focus of the court question, even as the bureaucracy around President Trump tries to calibrate or change the actual implementation of the executive order, it's going to be judged as it was written and as it was signed. And that's the problem for this White House. And you, you, know, you mentioned this idea of the tacit admission. As Ricky uh, said, uh, too, there could be a slight redrafting here uh, in order to address uh, the constitutionality of it. And yet that would be, uh, perhaps if nothing else, an explicit admission that something was wrong. And I want to get into this idea of tacit admissions. In the same interview with the president and Bill O'Reilly yesterday, we also saw the president say that there would be a new health care plan and perhaps, though, we wouldn't actually see it in 2017. It would be sometime perhaps into next year. This is a, something that he had promised, a simultaneous repealing and replacing weeks into this administration. Uh, that that we heard from the president yesterday certainly does not suggest what we'd heard previously. No, it does not. And if it weren't for the Russia news, if it weren't for the ongoing chaos, legal and otherwise, around the executive order, this would have been the biggest headline in the country other than the Super Bowl. Because this is the President of the United States admitting a political reality that, in my conversations with activists on the Republican side and lawmakers in the last couple of weeks, was becoming clearer and clearer to them. The idea of repealing and replacing Obamacare immediately had first bogged down and then essentially disappeared. Because they don't have a plan. Republicans in this White House do not have a plan to replace the Affordable Care Act. And there are increasing anxieties among Republicans about repealing the Affordable Care Act without a suitable replacement, because they don't want to leave people in the breach. They don't want to leave people in this enormous yawning and, in some cases, anxiety-filled gap of coverage between a repealed Affordable Care Act and whatever it is Republicans hope to pass in its wake. And so when the president said, I hope to have it by the end of this year, but it could be next year. He's already telling the country this process has bogged down. It wasn't so long ago, Josh, I would say within the last three weeks, where the president said very quickly, almost simultaneously, that rhetoric has disappeared entirely. Major Garrett, uh, much I'm sure you'll be getting to on your uh, podcast, The Takeout. I suppose <laughs> you'll also be making at least passing reference to uh, a contest of of athletic achievement that we saw yesterday. Quite a game, one, one, one quick word about the Super Bowl. I'm yeah. a man without an NFL team. The Chargers have moved to Los, to Los Angeles. I don't recognize that team anymore. Nobody really cares about that but me. But as a longtime Charger fan, I am a fan of the American Football League. And the American Football League won the Super Bowl last night. So I'm all in favor of that. Keeping it old school. <laughs> Maineans would do well to look at the calendar and recognize that we've got a new president uh, in the Oval Office. That disastrous nuclear deal that the last administration entered into with Iran, as General Flynn said, should have encouraged uh, a better behavior by the Iranians. But instead, what we see, whether it be uh, their, their flouting UN Security Council resolutions, uh, banning ballistic missile tests, or whether it be the way they're arming the Houthis in Yemen, who just last week attacked a Saudi Arabian ship, what we're seeing here here is hostile action, belligerent action being supported by or taken by the Iranians, and uh, we're just not going to put up with it anymore. The president issued other orders uh, this week, basically saying that he's going to revisit the Dodd-Frank regulations on the financial sector that were enacted after the 2008 crisis. Isn't this president sending a message to Wall Street that he's going to back off? No, the message that we're sending to Main Street is that we're going to pull back these this mountain of red tape that, that is stifling access to capital and loans, particularly for small businesses across this country, and we're going to get this economy moving again. i, I got to tell you, both on the campaign trail with the president and since the outset of the administration in meetings with business leaders and labor leaders, they, they, they tell us that in addition to cutting taxes, that, that rolling back the avalanche of red tape that's 
stifling this economy and frankly stifling the availability of loans and financial resources for companies is is of paramount importance and the action that the president took this week surrounded by uh, leaders in the Congress who've been working uh, to reform if not repeal Dodd-Frank is just the beginning of that effort and we're going to continue to work hard uh, while we protect consumers along the way we're going to continue to work hard to advance the kind of regulatory reform that will make resources right. and loans available for a growing America. But Mr. Vice President, the market spoke on Friday. The price of Wall Street firms, their stocks, rose sharply. And the fact is that two of the key players in revisiting the rules are going to be Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, and White House advisor Gary Cohn. And they are both former top executives at Goldman Sachs. That sure sounds like you're aiming at Wall Street, not Main Street. Well, but, it, and, and, you know, I, I understand that, and, and we're proud to have both of those men involved in this administration to bring their expertise. But look, the, the reality is that you can talk to small business owners across this, this country, and, and since the passage of Dodd-Frank, frankly, we, we've seen the availability of loans in, in banks across the country begin to dry up for small businesses. Simply the cost of compliance for smaller loans is too heavy in the wake of Dodd-Frank. That's what we're hearing from Main Street, right. and what you saw the president do this week is begin to roll back those regulations, use common sense and really unleash the kind of resources that are going to make it possible to see small business America and all of business America grow and create jobs. The president, in another action this week, nominated Neil Gorsuch to be his first nominee to the Supreme Court. Uh, and he said that if Democrats try to filibuster, Senate Republicans should change the rules so they can confirm him with 51 votes, not 60. Here is the president. We end up with that gridlock. I would say, if you can, Mitch, go nuclear. And yesterday, Mr. Vice President, you said that Gorsuch is going to get an up or down vote, quote, one way or another, which raises the question, is it helpful for one branch of the government to be interfering or poaching somehow on another branch? I mean, is it helpful to set this up as some kind of standoff between the Trump White House and Senate Democrats? You know, over the course of the campaign, President Trump made it clear that he was going to appoint for the vacancy on the Supreme Court um, a, a, a jurist in the tradition of the late and great Justice Antonin Scalia. Uh, and in Judge Neil Gorsuch, he's done that. This is someone who is extraordinarily qualified. His academic background uh, is remarkable from Columbia to Harvard to Oxford. He literally was 10 years ago, Chris, confirmed unanimously by the United States Senate. And, and we're very encouraged uh, at this point that more than a half a dozen Democrats have committed themselves to an up or down vote on the floor of the Senate. Neil Gorsuch belongs on the United States Supreme Court, but no, no associate justice to the Supreme Court in American history has ever faced a successful filibuster, and Neil Gorsuch should not be the first. That's why the President and I have both made it clear we're going to work with Senate leadership, and one way or the other, uh, Judge Gorsuch is going to get an up or down vote on the floor of the Senate, and we're confident that he'll be confirmed as the newest associate justice to the Supreme Court. I want to pick up on that because after President Trump sent out one of his tweets dismissing the judge in the immigration ban case as a, quote, so-called judge, the Democratic Senate leader, uh, Chuck Schumer, said that that just shows why there should be even extra scrutiny of Gorsuch because there is a need for an independent judge to stand up against a president who's talking about so-called judges. Well, I think it just shows, uh, frankly, I just think it shows how Senator Schumer is going to reach to anything to try and uh, continue to obstruct uh, the nomination of Judge uh, Gorsuch to the Supreme Court. But that's nothing new. I mean, I've got to be honest with you. It's really been surprising to me since the advent of this administration to see the obstruction by Senator Schumer and Senate Democrats of, of one cabinet nominee after another. I may, I, I, I'm going to be called on 
next week for the first time in American history as vice president to cast the deciding tie-breaking vote for a cabinet nominee. Chris, that's never happened in the history of this country, but I think it shows the level of obstruction by the Democrats in the Senate, and the American people are tired of it. They, they want to see the Supreme Court have a new justice. They want to see this yep. president have his cabinet, and we're going to continue to work our hearts out for the American people to make sure all those things happen, despite uh, Senator Schumer uh, and his colleagues' obstruction of efforts. And in 10 seconds, Mr. Vice President, how confident are you that you have the 50 votes so you can cast the tie-breaking vote to put Betsy DeVos in as Education Secretary? 10 seconds. We're very confident that Betsy DeVos is going to be the next Secretary of Education. It'll be my high honor to cast uh, the deciding tie-breaking vote on the floor of the Senate next week. Mr. Vice President.